Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott, and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day at 8 a.m. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Crestwood Equity stock and analyzing its financial ratios. Let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe or comment below. I respond to all comments. Also, if you'd like to do a private Zoom session with me to discuss financials, receive a custom valuation for a stock of your choice, or support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Crestwood Equity Partners is an oil and gas midstream company. Midstream refers to points in the oil production process that falls between upstream and downstream. Midstream activities include the storage, processing, and transportation of petroleum. Let's get started with the model. This company has a market cap of $1.1 billion, so they're a small cap company. They're trading at $14.60 a share, and they have 73 million shares outstanding. If you want to calculate shares outstanding, it's market cap divided by stock price gives you shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. Free cash flow is how you value a company. You estimate the future free cash flows, and then you discount that back to today's dollars. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. Capital expenditures are investments in property, plant, and equipment. If a company has positive free cash flow, it has the ability to pay down debt, pay dividends, acquire other businesses, or invest back into their business to grow it. If a company has negative free cash flow, it might not be able to do any of those things. And this company has positive free cash flow in two of the four years. Their net income is also positive in two years, negative in two years. Net income is the profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. So let's go to the income statement to see why it's negative in two years. So in 2016 and 2017, they had negative net income. And you'll notice in 2017, their revenue is 3.9 billion, which is the largest number in the four years we can see here. Below revenue is cost of revenue. That's how much money the company spends in order to generate the revenue on its income statement. Even though their revenue is the highest in 2017, their gross profit is the lowest. Gross profit is revenue minus cost of revenue. Generally, the higher the revenue, the more economies of scale set in and you can become more efficient. They are not becoming more efficient. They seem to be becoming less efficient. They do a better job in future years at managing their cost of revenue. Below gross profit is operating expenses. Operating expenses are all expenses that are not directly related to making the product or providing the service. A common type of operating expense is payroll for accounting or payroll for marketing, but the payroll for the workers who are actually making the products is in cost of revenue. Then there's operating income. That's how much money the company makes on its everyday operational business. Below that is the interest they pay in their debt. So you should always make sure the interest they pay in their debt is not more than the operating income. It is in 2017. That's not a good sign because that means they have no money left over to pay taxes or pay dividends. Below the interest expense is other. A company needs to report on its income statement when it generates money or when it pays expenses on its non-core business. The company does generate a good amount of cash flow from its equity interest. This occurs when a company invests in another company and has significant influence over that company. Usually it owns between 20 to 50% of its stock. In 2016, you can see a large impairment of $162 million. Companies like this generally impair goodwill and machinery. So if they bought a machine for $5 million six years ago, but if the market value of the machine has dropped significantly, they have to reduce the amount on their balance sheet and pass it through as a loss on the income statement. So this is a $162 million loss. It brings down their net income, but it's a non-cash item, so it doesn't affect their cash flow. But in 2018 and 2019, they had positive net income and negative free cash flow. Let's look at the cash flow statement. So free cash flow is cash flow from operations, that's up here on top, operating cash flow, minus capital expenditures. That's investment in property, plant, and equipment. And in 2018 and 2019, they had significant amount of PP&A relative to 2016 and 2017. So that really brought down its free cash flow. But if you look at the financials, there's so many things going on. I'm just pointing out the major things I saw. Their revenue jumped a lot from 2016 to 2017, but it's been going down since then. 
Let's look at a capital structure. $2.3 billion of debt, also $2.3 billion of equity. They pay 4.66% interest on their debt and they don't pay taxes because they're an MLP. MLP stands for Master Limited Partnership. To qualify, the business must receive at least 90% of its revenue from natural resources or real estate. This company receives its revenue from natural resources. And an MLP issues units, not shares. So there's no equity in the balance sheet. In order to calculate the equity to come up with some of the ratios later, I just took the total assets minus total liabilities. And they're 50% debt and 50% equity. I prefer to invest in companies below 50% debt. So they're doing okay, they're not too leveraged. The cost of equity is 33.5%. To figure out cost of equity, we use a capital asset pricing model. And part of the CAPM formula is the beta. The beta is how volatile the stock is relative to the market. And they have a really high beta, 4.06. Beta is a measure of a stock's volatility. So if the market as a whole goes up 1% in a certain time frame, this stock should go up 4%. If the market goes down 1%, this stock should go down 4%. When you invest in a company, there's two types of risk, systematic and unsystematic. Beta is systematic risk, meaning it moves with the system, the market. The market has inherent risk. If Trump tweeted there's a vaccine for coronavirus and everybody's gonna be healthy within a week or two, the market would go way up. And that has nothing to do with an individual company. The market has a mind of itself. Or if Trump tweeted that it's gonna be another two years of COVID, the market may crash. Another type of systematic risk. An unsystematic risk can be diversified away. If the company's generating a lot of cash flow, making good decisions, your stock price may go up. But if the company's making bad decisions and losing money, your stock price may go down. So don't think of beta as the risk of the stock, it's just the volatility of the stock. The higher the beta, the higher the cost of equity. Their WAC is 19.18%, which is a blend of the cost of debt and cost of equity. And the WAC is a discount rate companies use when they want to take on new projects. So for example, if this company had a new project that cost them $1 million upfront to take on the project, but they would receive $100,000 of cash flows over the next 20 years, what they would do is they would discount those 20 years of cash flows back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. And if the value of those 20 years of cash flows in today's dollars was 1.5 million, they would take on the project because it cost them a million dollars. They'd be making $500,000. But if they discounted those 20 years of cash flows back to today and it was worth $800,000, they would not take on a project because it cost them a million dollars and they'd be losing $200,000. You only want to take on projects that add value to the company. And the WAC is a discount rate we're going to apply to the future cash flows for this model. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's $837 million. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $592 million. We divide that by 73 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price at 809. They're trading at 1460, so they're trading at an 81% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Simply Wall Street is in the other direction. They're saying the stock is worth 2277, so they're saying it's a buy. Simply Wall Street uses the average analyst estimate. Let's see where the stock has been trading at the past few years. It looks like the stock price peaked in the low 30s but it's come down a lot. It has come up since the bottom at coronavirus. It's still well below its all-time highs. Their dividend is a little more than six cents a quarter. It was close to 14 cents in 2015 and 2016. Currently, their dividend yield is a little over 17%, so it's a really good return. Let's look at the financial ratios. They have a great PE. The median for the market is 16.4. The average is 18.1. PE is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. I like to see below 15, they're at 3.7, so investors are paying $3.70 for $1 of earnings. Price of sales is really good also. The median is 2.0, the average is 4.7. Price of sales is stock price over sales per share. To calculate sales per share, that's revenue over shares outstanding. I like to see below 2.5, they're at 0.3, so investors are paying 30 cents for $1 revenue. Price to book is also really good. The median is 2.3, the average is 4.9. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. To calculate book value per share, that's equity over shares outstanding. 
I like to see below 3.5, they're at 0.5, so investors are paying 50 cents for $1 book value. Equity is total assets minus total liabilities on the balance sheet. They have a low interest coverage ratio, the median is 4.1, the average is 13.1. Interest coverage ratio is EBIT over interest expense. I like to see above 2, they're at 1.8 so they can just cover their interest payments. EBIT is earnings before interest and taxes. It's called operating income on the income statement. ROE is decent. The median is 12%, the average is 13%. ROE is net income over equity. I like to see above 20%, they're at 12%. Good current ratio, the median is 1.3, the average is 1.8. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. I like to see between 1.2 and 2 but they're at 1.1 so they can cover their current liabilities. Current assets are assets that can be liquidated into cash within 12 months. Examples are cash, accounts receivables, and inventory. Current liabilities are debts and payables that are due within 12 months. Examples are current debt and accounts payable. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos on 23 oil and gas midstream companies. Crestwood is right here, and if they have a number in green, they're better than the average. If they have a number in red, they're worse than the average. So they are better than average in PE, price to sales and price to book. They're doing really well in those ratios. Their current ratio is fine, 1.1. ROE, they're better than the average. They have lower debt than the average. They are a small company, a little over 1 billion market cap, and they do pay a higher dividend than average at 17%. The average is 12%. To summarize, I have them trading at an 81% premium because their financials are all over the place and if a company doesn't have consistent numbers, it's hard to value them. Their ratios look really good. Let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe or comment below. I respond to all comments. Also, if you'd like to do a private Zoom session with me to discuss financials, receive a custom valuation for a stock of your choice, or support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.